Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is secondary resistor reduced voltage starters. Our objective is to examine both hardwire relay-based ladder logic and programmable logic controller, or PLC-based implementations of secondary resistor reduced voltage starters used to reduce inrush current demand for wound rotor induction motors. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has watched the wound rotor induction motor lecture and those lectures comprising the reduced voltage starters and timers playlists available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please bring yourself to speed and return when you're so qualified. As you are no doubt aware, the direct and instantaneous application of full voltage to a motor at standstill produces a tremendous surge of current known as inrush. You should be as tired of hearing this as I am of saying it. Although brief, inrush can place unnecessarily high demand on the electrical distribution network and industries often pay a financial penalty for such events. It is for this reason various types of reduced voltage starting methods are employed, all of which serve to limit both inrush current and modify the starting torque of a motor under the direction. In the aforementioned motor control playlist, we examine several types of reduced voltage starting methods including, but not limited to, primary resistor reduced voltage starters, part winding reduced voltage starters, Y start delta run reduced voltage starters, soft starters, and motor drives. In these applications, we limited our discussion to squirrel cage induction motors, a common type of three-phase AC induction motor. While these same methods are applicable to other types of motors, other types of motors also offer alternate reduced voltage starting methods based upon their construction and theory of operation. Case in point, consider wound rotor induction motors. Wound rotor induction motors, since they offer accessibility to the rotor via a set of slip rings, allow a degree of rotor customization not possible with a fixed resistance rotor squirrel cage induction motor. As we learned in the aforementioned wound rotor induction motor lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, wound rotor induction motors with low resistance rotors behave like design B squirrel cage induction motors and operate relatively efficiently at high speeds. This being said, they don't exert terribly high starting torque and are known to experience a large surge of inrush upon start. Conversely, wound rotor induction motors with high resistance rotors behave like design D squirrel gauge induction motors and exert high torque at low speeds with less inrush at the start. This being said, they're not known for outstanding efficiency. Consider these plots of inrush current upon closure of a full voltage starter for two different rotor configurations experiencing one newton meter of counter torque. A low resistance design B style rotor at the top and a high resistance design D style rotor at the bottom. In the slightly loaded condition, it looks like the low resistance rotor experienced an inrush current peaking out at what, maybe 8 amps? That seems a little over the top for something that may be drawing 1 amp RMS in the steady state condition. In contrast, the high resistance rotor experiences only a peak at most of maybe 6 amps, a far more reasonable and achievable demand. This being said, if we kept it in this high resistance condition for long, we wouldn't expect it to operate that efficiently. Wouldn't it be great if you had the high torque starting ability and low inrush current demand of a high resistance design D rotor, and when the load is actually moving, switch over to a low resistance design B rotor such that it operates more efficiently at high rotational speed. We'll check it out. Wound rotor induction motors employing secondary resistor reduced voltage starters allow this stage transition from high resistance start to a low resistance run mode. Or allow me to demonstrate. One way of toggling between high and no resistance operation is with a shunt contactor in parallel to an external bank of resistors. When the shunt contactor is open, the external resistor bank is placed in series of the rotor and the motor operates like a high resistance design D scroll cage induction motor. In contrast, when the shunt contactor closes, the resistor bank is shorted out or bypassed, excluding them from the rotor circuit and the motor operates like a low resistance design B scroll cage induction motor. As you may have guessed, a secondary resistor reduced voltage starter starts the motor with the shunt contactor open such that the motor exerts high starting torque with low inrush, then after a predetermined period of time, closes the shunt contactor such the motor operates more efficiently at higher speeds. Consider a hardwired, relay-based ladder logic implementation of a secondary resistor reduced voltage starter employing a timer executing the on-delay function. Viewers will recall an on-delay sometimes it's called a delay on energize or DOE or slow operating or SO timer, exhibit a customizable delay time between when the timer coil is energized and when the associated contacts change states. When the timer coil is energized, the associated normally closed contact remains closed and the normally open contact remains open. Only after a predetermined time delay, TD is elapsed, 
Do the normally closed contacts open and the normally open contacts close. When the timer coil is de-energized, the associated contacts return to their deactivated states. I.e. the normally closed contact recloses and the normally open contact reopens. You'll sometimes see the contacts executing the on delay, delay on energize, or slow operating function using an arrow to signify which operation is being delayed. Here's a symbol for a normally closed time open contact, often abbreviated NCTO. The contact is drawn normally closed, however the arrow indicates the opening of the contact is delayed after the coil has been energized for a predetermined time. Similarly, here's a symbol for a normally open time closed contact often abbreviated as NOTC. The contact is drawn normally open, however the arrow indicates the closing of the contact is delayed after the coil has been energized for a predetermined time. As helpful and informative as these schematic symbols are, for some reason they've fallen out of favor. I may just see a contact associated with a timer illustrated as a regularly normally closed or normally open contact as in this implementation. The primary circuit consists of the M contactor in series with an overload on the stator windings a shunt contactor S and an external resistor bank on the slip rings on the rotor. Key to this particular application is the controlled closure of the S shunt contactor. We first want the M contactor to close and energize the wound rotor induction motor stator with the shunt contactor open such that the secondary resistors are included in the rotor circuit. Then after a predetermined period of time, let's say three seconds is elapsed, Close the shunt contactor such that the secondary resistors are shorted out and excluded from the rotor circuit. The top three rungs of the pilot circuit largely concern the M contactor, whereas rungs four and five concern themselves with the timer and the shunt contactor. Rung one consists of the series combination of a normally closed E stop, a normally closed stop, a normally open start, the coil of control relay CR1, and a normally closed thermal overload. All the normally closed devices serve to de-energize CR1 in the event of an operator-initiated stop, an emergency, or a sustained overload. An operator can start the system by closing the start button, which energizes the coil of CR1. When CR1 energizes, its associated contacts in rung 2, 3, and 4 simultaneously change states. The CR1 contact in rung 2 closes and establishes a holding circuit, allowing an operator release start. The CR1 contact in rung 3 closes and energizes the M primary contactor coil. The M contactor closes and the motor starts. Importantly, the motor starts in the high resistance configuration since the shunt contactor is open. In high resistance mode, the motor exerts high starting torque and experiences notably less inrush. The motor accelerates. Lastly, the CR1 contact in rung 4 closes and energizes the coil of timer 1 executing the on delay. DOE or SO function. Given the timer is executing a delay on energize function, its associated contacts, notably TR1 in rung 5, remains open until the delay is elapsed. This being said, the clock is running. Three seconds later, the timer completes the on delay function and the TR1 contact in rung 5 closes, energizing the shunt contactor coil. Shunt contactor closes, shorts out the resistor bank, and the motor transitions to low resistance mode, suitable for high speed, efficient operation. An operator wishing to stop the system and reset the starting state would press and release stop. Here's a real time simulation of this circuit using Automation Studio. As we illustrated in the walkthrough, an operator presses and release start to close the M contactor, establish a holding circuit, and start the timer. Three seconds later, the timer reaches its count and closes the shunt contactor, shorting out the resistor bank. As we anticipated, the motor starts in high resistance mode with high starting torque and less inrush. After a predetermined delay, allowing a degree of time to accelerate, the shunt contactor shorts out the resistor bank and the motor switches to low resistance mode, suitable for high speed efficient operation. Here's the system in operation once again. Secondary resistor reduced voltage starters can also be implemented using a programmable logic controller or PLC. One of the major advantages of PLC is that they are reprogrammable devices and do not need to be rewired to change functionality. Consider this selection of hardware connected to a PLC input and output card in the following fashion. On the input side, normally closed stop is wired to digital input 0, normally open start is wired to digital input 1, and finally, auxiliary contact M1 associated with the M primary contactor is wired to digital input 2. 
On the output side, the coil of the M primary contactor is wired to digital output 0, and the coil of the shunt contactor S is wired to digital output 1. Viewers will note the normally closed e-stop is hardwired to break the connection to pilot level voltage to all input and all output elements without the involvement of the programmed instructions. Viewers will additionally note the M1 auxiliary contact on digital input 2 serves to convey real-world feedback to the PLC about the status of the M contactor. Finally, viewers will note the normally closed overload is hardwired in series with a parallel connection to the M and S coils, thus serving to de-energize both these output elements without involvement of the programmed instructions. Long story short, never trust a computer. Anytime the e-stop or overload opens, regardless of what the PLC program is telling it to do, the system will not energize the M or S contactor coils. It is my sincere recommendation to have this level of safety redundancy in any system you work on.